it was during the World Cup soccer. <laughs> The baby in, in the stomach was kicking and kicking and kicking. <laughs> so he uh, ended up um, calling, uh, well, naming uh, the baby in Maradona. Maradona. Soccer has been part of our culture for a very long time. There's a legend about the Aurora Borealis, and the name of it is Aksarni. When people die, we, we go play soccer with a walrus skull. <laughs> We're fifth generation. There's my mom, me, my son, my granddaughter, and my great-grandson. I have 20 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Everybody knows everybody, and I know every one of people in Cape Dorset. It's dry up here, but it's cold. Minus 40 with wind chills up to minus 50. But we survive. King Aid, or Cape Dorset, it gets its name from the hills and the mountains around it. Long as I can remember, you know, they've been carving for years. People coming in, missionary, Northwest Company coming over here, whalers, you know. People been carving a long time. The history of Inuit carvings was originally to pass time during the winter month when it's cold outside. The Golden Glove Award for goalkeepers is inspired by the Kimmi. This dog has been with us in the Arctic for at least 4,000 years. The Kamik is a protector of the community and part of the family. They are built strong for the hunt. Loyal, tough, brave, and intelligent. They have helped Inuit survive for generations. I'm from Cape Dorset. I'm an artist. I'm a carver. The hour is symbol of wisdom and knowledge. You can recognize it by its round, forward facing eyes. It flies so silent over the tundra. It has a strong vision which gives the ability to see what others cannot. Opik have been part of many of our legends in the north. Do 
he called me Takeluk Nuna, Tak for short, and I do uh, carving or sculpting uh, stones. I was just playing outside, and my late father was carving along with my my brother, and I ended up uh, carving my first my first carving. I don't know how it looks. <laughs> But uh, my father sold it. He ended up with a uh, couple of uh, ammo boxes. The bear is a powerful animal that wanders and finds its way across the ice. The young Atitelak learns to hunt, swim, feed, and survive off the land. Powers of transformation. I remember once I saw a bear from behind a rock. I stood up to get a look. A bird flew away from where the bear was. We believe it imitates humans and how we move. So the bear can be kicking a ball, carve out a white marble, a delicate stone to work with. Some carvers with boats bring soapstone here and sell it to the co-op, and artists buy it from there. When you go into the container and look at the stone, to me it's a gold mine. <laughs> and, and I like the stone, all the stones. We have white marble, black marble, serpentine, soapstone. That's how I pick the stone. Look at it, and hopefully there's no cracks, and visualize what I'm going to make. I've been in the quarry. It's a little bit far from here. It's hard to get down there, too. It's about 70 to 80 miles, or close to 100 miles. We go mine the stone there, which we call Kangatsukuta. Uh, and I carve. Two ghost squirrels are courageous and fearless in the hunt. They need to be adapted to the conditions that can change very quickly. High winds, snow, blizzard. A good hunter always finds a way. They are patient and strike when the moment is right. Most harpoon heads were made out of ivory from walrus tusks or whale bones, like the harpoon in the carving. Nekatritu. <laughs> North Star. It is a stone built by Inuit on the land as helpers. Each inner took of something different. The top stone points towards the sky to the North Star. There are many months of darkness during the winter here. Nekatri took is important to navigate through the stars and to lead a travel home sending them into the right direction. It is a star that never moves. Inuits have lived for thousands of years working as a group. They stick together, they help each other out in times of need. This community is a community that has given so much value to the world, to Canadians, from their imaginations, from the stone.
carving will always continue. There will always be carvers for generations and generations. Well, hello, Canada. We hope you enjoyed the screening of From Stone. And now to learn a little bit more about the film, happy to bring in the director of the film, Adrian Asufi. Congratulations on the screening, Adrian. How are things going and where are you holding up right now during this pandemic? Hey, thanks for, uh, for having me. Um, yeah, right now I'm uh, in my studio here in Toronto, uh, just kind of in the same boat as everyone else, uh, trying to focus on on the positive side and uh, focus on what we can control. And yeah, it's been all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's everyone's mood right now. It's, it's been all right. It's been all right. Yeah. To back to some normal. So Adrian, obviously this rollout of the film was initially premiered at the CPL awards and we've waited this long. And now with National Indigenous Peoples Day on Sunday, the 21st of this month, we're rolling it out to the general public. So we just wanna have you walk us through some of the behind the scenes and let us learn a little bit more about the person behind the film and the stories behind the film. So let's go back to the very beginning first. And I'll ask you this, what were your initial thoughts when the CPL approached you about this project? Yeah, I was, uh, so the CPL team approached, uh, approached me with this project and I was super excited to hear about, you know, the idea um, of engaging with the Northern community. Um, and, and I thought this was like a brilliant way to start the relationship um, and bridge the gap, use the sport of soccer to bridge the gap between, um, between communities. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, what I was really um, happy about was the way, you know, the team, the CPL team worked so closely and collaboratively um, with the artists, with everyone involved on the project um, and the creative freedom that they wanted to give the artists in bringing and interpreting these awards. Um, and that for me was right off the bat, um, a no brainer in terms of uh, moving forward with it and so yeah after that we um, decided to go with a uh, community of Kingite uh, which formerly known as, as Cape Dorset um, because it is uh, a community that has given so much uh, to the rest of Canada um, it is I think the highest population of artists um, and uh, you know creativity just flows throughout the community and this was um, yeah an amazing an amazing opportunity to to be a part of this 
Yeah, I can only imagine what an experience that must have been for you. We're going to get to the trophies themselves in just a little bit, but I do want to make a note for our viewers on YouTube right now that Tristan Borges, who swept, pretty much swept this award ceremony, every outfield award you could win, he won. Asa Raymond will be speaking to him after we're done here with Adrian, so stay tuned for that. We'll get to the awards in just a little bit, but more back to the pre-production planning and as you get into Kingite, what were some of the stories that you wanted to tell after researching and learning about this community? Yeah, actually, my journey with um, soccer and in the North started a few years ago when they had the opportunity to go to another community in Nunavut called um, Ahviet. And it was I, there was a turf field there, um, an artificial turf, and it was during the summer. So the snow had just come off the ground. And there's probably like a short window where, you know, the young people and community members can play. And I was just taken aback by the talent. Just, just purely just the talent and the excitement and the passion and how many uh, people were there on the pitch playing every day. And that kind of um, sparked an interest in terms of, you know, uh, finding out ways to further connect and build um, these, these relationships uh, through the sport. And so, uh, Kingite uh, was a community that I had the uh, privilege to visit a few months earlier um, and, and meet the community members and really see firsthand uh, what an impact these, uh, the artists have in the community. And um, yeah, and, and after that, I mean, really the stories in terms of, you know, that can be told uh, through the lens of the sport are, are endless. And so... Um, you know, we're hoping this is, you know, just the first of, of many stories that the CPL will be will be sharing. Mm -hmm. Now, technically speaking, these awards, they're massive. They're really heavy. They're really obviously well constructed, well built and built with a lot of love and passion. But they're immaculate pieces of stone. So talk to us about the, the technical side of it and, and the ability to get some of these beautiful shots that we saw in the dock focusing on the awards and the artists? Yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's one thing to see the finished product and it's another thing to see where this, this actually came from. And uh, the, the stones actually come from a quarry that are, you know, I think like about a hundred kilometers away from the community. There's a few that go and, and bring the stone back. And really when you look at it, it's just, it looks like you'd, you wouldn't be able to tell how, how would someone be able to make something so beautiful, so clean, so sharp from just this raw piece of stone. And, um, and so you have the carvers that go to the local co-op and they are looking for the perfect stone. They're looking for, they know what they want to envision uh, making from it. And they search through the rubble, they search through the the pile of stones and they find uh, the one that they think is going to work. Um, and so the community works a lot with uh, soapstone and marble. Um, and uh, yeah, and then they, they, each of them have their own studios set up. Uh, so in King, I, a lot of the times you'll see uh, a lot of outdoor studios, you know, whether it's like a shed or even just a stool with a table uh, and a lot of electrical tools um, that the, that the carvers use nowadays uh but before it was more traditional um you know without any without electrical tools so uh just to see the whole process um from beginning to end and it's and it's highlighted in the documentary really shows the the i guess the weight uh you know no pun intended but the weight of how you know magical these these awards are now adrian obviously you spent a lot of time with the artists shooting the awards and, and getting to know the community and sort of helping to tell their story because that's really what the artists are doing with these awards is telling a story was there one in particular a certain artist or a certain trophy that had a story you found the most compelling yeah i um the one that really stood out to me from just from the way that it was the idea came about uh was the best canadian under 21 player award mm -hmm. uh, and it was carved by Takialo Nuna and uh, it's the, the dancing polar bear uh, kicking a soccer ball. So this was uh, an award where Takialo Nuna is 
specializes in, in polar bears and dancing polar bears. And we wanted to represent youth, um, you know, through this award. And so the polar bear, as we know, at birth is playful uh, and it's adored. Uh, and the young cub grows and, and shows its promise to become an Anuk, which is um, a polar bear, which is one of the most, you know, um, respected and formidable animals, uh, you know, that roams Canada's north. And so what was really beautiful was when the CPL uh, came to, went to Takialuk and we chatted with him and we talked about the idea he said, okay, give me, a, give me a day, give me a night, uh, I'll think about it and come visit me tomorrow again. And the next day when we went back to visit him, he came up with the idea of the bear kicking the soccer ball, of the uh, white marble ball that you see in the award. And what was really beautiful about it was that he right away, he has a lot of pieces of marble laying around his outdoor studio, which you'll see in the, in, the, in the short documentary. And he went and he scoured through a few of them and he picked one up and he threw it up in his hand and he said, okay, this one will do. And he took out a tool that he said he hadn't used in months and started shaping a sphere, started shaping the ball out of this white marble. And that for me was the... Uh, I got one of the most magical moments um, kind of seeing the the in that in the most magical moment that you know this that the project kind of was looking to create um, and so yeah that that was uh, that and that ended up being a, a I certainly think a favorite amongst uh, you know the a lot of fans of the CPL and yeah yeah, it's, it's a remarkable trophy. I mean, I know I struggled to draw a circle, so I can't imagine trying to carve a, a perfect sphere out of marble. So obviously hats off to the artist. Adrian, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, why do you think it's so important for organizations like the Canadian Premier League to tell these stories and to give voice to our artists and our neighbors up north? Indigenous peoples in general, especially. Yeah, um, I think the, the, the most common... I guess, thought or feedback that I get um, in, in Northern communities and my friends in, in Northern communities is that there's not enough, the voice, the Northern voices are not included enough down in the South. And so when we have an organization, when we have uh, the CPL looking to bring different people together from the East to the West, to the North, all through the lens of the sport, um, I think it's, it's a beautiful thing and it's what the, 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 you know, what we call the beautiful game was, was meant to do was to bring people together and to create a sense of belonging. And so I think it's extremely important to have that representation, to have those voices uh, included in this national conversation. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I know that this is the beginning of a, of a really beautiful relationship with between the CPL and, and Northern communities. And uh, I'm excited to see uh, everything that comes out of it. Finally, before we let you go, if there is one thing or one story you would like the average viewer to take away from this documentary, this film, what would it be and why? Yeah, I hope that the, you know, the viewers and, 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 and communities across Canada are able to learn uh, and, and witness the, the beauty that uh, King Knight has to offer. Um, and, and they learn a little bit more about this community in the North. And really, you know, something that we, that we all know, but it's really, it's really exemplified and projected is, is the power of, of the sport. And I hope viewers are able to see, you know, how much energy and how much passion there is for the sport. Um, you know, from a young age all the way to, you know, the elders and, and, and really see how the sport has always been uh, a part of the North, uh, you know, for hundreds of years, you know, not necessarily in the way we know it today, um, but that there is a lot of passion and energy and, um, and hopefully we can find more ways to, 
to connect more ways to grow the sport in the north. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm, I'm really excited to see where this goes. Well, he is the director of From Stone, Adrian Asufi. Once again, congratulations. It was great to see the film again. It's been a long time since the CPL Awards and I got the chance to see it the first time. So it was nice to see it again. Nice to see you again. Thank you for the time and best of luck in the future. Thank you very much. Stick around. Next up on One Soccer, our Asa Raymond in conversation with the CPL Award sweeper, Tristan Borges. <laughs> Well, hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the documentary about the unique artistic design of the Canadian Premier League trophies. I'm Asa Raymond. I'm happy to be joined by the man who took home three of those beautiful pieces of art, a winner of the Golden Boots, the best U21 Canadian and the CPL Player of the Year, former Forge FC forward, currently in Belgium with OH Leuven, Tristan Borges. So welcome, Tristan. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. Yeah, last time I saw you, I was at the CPL award ceremony itself. You were juggling those three heavy awards. Did you get them home safely? And uh, where did you display them when you got them home? I did. I did. Um, it was uh, it was definitely an amazing day for myself. Uh, right when I got home, it was because when I went, I went with a, a, a close friend of mine. Right. So that was uh, just getting home. That was the first time that my family saw it. Right. So just put it uh, across the table, I think. I'm not the biggest person for social media, but I'm pretty sure I posted something on my uh, on my story that uh, that day uh, just of them three. And my family is very proud of me. So in my basement, it's uh, it's put up nice in a nice. in a good spot just for us to always kind of be reminded. I mean, reminded of the year that I had. So it's it's nice. It's quite the year. Uh, is there one award that stands out? Maybe the sweetest for you? Uh, well, if I have to look at winning something it's definitely the championship with the team for me that's that's the most important one right but when it comes to the award i think uh it's it's obviously mvp there was a lot of good candidates there right so you know have playing with great players that year and i love it you know everybody trying to show what they could do and a lot of players having great years you know with goals assists and even if it wasn't just having you know all the stats you could see a lot of players had a lot of quality in games you know making it difficult to play against so if I had to pick one out of those three, uh, it would it would it would probably be MVP. Yeah. What about the design of these trophies? Anything stand out to you about uh, how they look, they feel? Um, something that makes you uh, proud to be a Canadian to, to own these three awards? Yeah, I think I think it just being unique. You know, I don't think uh, you know when you think of um, getting an award, especially in sports. You know, I don't think that's your first idea to look at it. But us, you know, finally getting this league a part of Canada and, you know, making your, like just showing how important it is, you know, and it being unique like that and just being very different just makes it special in my opinion, you know, having it inside the house, you know, when you look at it, like I said, it's not kind of like an everyday award that you look at that, you know, maybe shines in the room or something that's silver, something that's gold. Right. But I think it having that unique kind of part to it, it just makes it more special. 
He mentioned uh, winning the championship with Forge, which is the, probably the greatest accomplishment uh, of that year. Uh, what stands out uh, about that year and that championship run? For me, it's just, you know, being with the guys throughout that whole process. You know, there was a lot of ups and downs in the whole year. For me, I'm a very big person when it comes to, you know, kind of falling in love with the grind, right? It's, right. you know, the moment is very, very special itself. Just, um, I think everybody knows that moment. Once we scored that goal, everybody's running down the field, right? But for me, it's just, you look back at all the ups and downs that we had, you know, I think a lot, there was so much uh, talk before the league started about our team and everybody kind of said, okay, you know, how well are they going to do? And, you know, we had a lot of games that we should have got results and, and, and we didn't, but you can see the maturity level in the group that we had. We had, in my opinion, the best captain in the league, you know, for me, like I said before, it should have been the MVP. Right. But what he did with our group in terms of bringing it together, you know, we had a lot of young guys, a lot of guys with their first uh, professional season ever. Right. So, it took a lot for us to get all the way there, you know, going through the bumps, uh, the bumps that we did. And I think it, it was that, that's the best way to cap it off, you know, the way we uh, the way we won it. So for me, it's the whole year. It's the whole year. Yeah, after that amazing year, uh, you end up signing with uh, OH Leuven. Uh, what was that like, that process like? Uh, when did you find out? How did you find out? Uh, everything kind of moved pretty fast, to be honest. I mean, um, once the league was done. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knew there was always just talk. Okay, Tristan, are you going to stay? Are you going to go? And for me, it was just, it was just already focusing on to next year, you know, just keeping a good relationship with the guys and just staying connected with them. Um, but yeah, everything kind of happened pre pretty fast. First contact was, was around Christmas. And then, uh, you know, during Christmas and new year's, it's always a difficult time to kind of get things going. Everybody's with their families and, and, uh, and things like that. But yeah, it happened pretty fast. Same thing with, uh, with the national team. So everything was kind of bunched in together yeah. and I ended up going a little bit late uh, uh, to the second part of the season. But I mean, at the end of the day, it was just about, you know, them trusting in what I could do. And, you know, I ended up being very fit when I went. So I did as much as I could in the off season. So I kind of just jumped into the season uh, when they were going and I kind of just fit in and things, uh, things went well after that. Were there any other teams that you were considering or even considering uh, returning to Forge? Uh, returning to Forge was always, was, was always in my head, you know? Uh, um, yeah. Just coming back to the city, you know, playing in the CPL, it was definitely a thought that I made and it was, I wanted to be part of something special and just looking at what we did the first year, I, I wanted to come back, you know, and, and, uh, and try to do it again in the second year. There was, there was a, there was a few interests from the MLS clubs, uh, you know, I think uh, Montreal was one of them. And, um, and at the end of the day, it was it was going to be my decision. But, you know, just making the decision to come here in Belgium. There's a lot of great talk about this club. It's a great club. Since I've been here um, the past couple of months. It's been rough for everybody. Right. So um, but, you yeah, know, since I've been here, it's been amazing. And I'm glad I made the decision. Yeah. Uh, leagues have shut down or were shut down around the world. Summer restarting now. Um, where were you with the club before uh, things were halted? Uh, things were going well. Things were going well. Um, when I first when I first got here, the first week uh, I had to get kind of more of the paperwork and everything uh, everything in. So I uh, also I sat down and watched the first game. So I, I watched it from the sidelines. I was watching it from up top. And then uh, since. I think since I got onto the bench, I came on, I think, four games. One game I didn't, and, and then the last game I, I started. So, you know, for me, if, if I were to look at it, that's – I would say that that's – you know, every player always wants to start. But at the end of the day, for me, coming off of uh, two months of off season, basically, and, and uh, everybody's already in shape and, you know, kind of mid-season flow, right, and to come in and, you know, come, come off the bench four times for him to trust me to come off the bench – and, uh, and to start the last game was big. You know, I didn't end up being on the bench the first the first leg of the finals. Um, you know, coach's decision just with kind of being experienced and a lot of a lot of things at stake for that game. Right. It's the, you know, this is the biggest games for our, our club history. Right. So. Um, but, yeah, now we're working towards the second finals on August 2nd. And just since I've been there, it's uh, it's been up and down because of the pandemic. Right. But at right. the end of the day, everybody's going through it. But when it comes to being on the field, there's. It's been a progress every day. Yeah, you played uh, in that game on the right side as a as a wingback in a three five two. Uh, what was that experience like? It was 
different, but a little similar at the same time. Like I said, the last year uh, when I was with Hennem Fain, there was a few uh, moments I had playing a left back, a few games, just because of how the roster was shifting out. We need, we, we were losing a little bit more defensive players. And I can say I have a little bit more of that edge to my game when it comes to having that aggression. And, you know, being here, the Belgian kind of league is, is an aggressive league, right? So, um, yeah, I spoke with the coach before the game that it could have been a possibility, right? And uh, it ended up working out that, you know, I felt comfortable at the same time. For me, it's if as, lo as long as I'm on the field, I'm happy, right? Uh, you know, the coach puts me in and I got to do what I have to do, right? But yeah. it wasn't something that I was completely shocked at. I, I already had it in my mind a little bit. And at the end of the day, I just got on the field and you have to do what you have to do. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you had MLS options. Uh, one of them I understand to be the Montreal Impact, which is where Joel Waterman ended up. Uh, do you regret that at all? Uh, where do you think uh, what happened with Montreal and why not the MLS? No, I'm very I'm I'm happy with my decision. You know, the MLS is a, is a great league. Obviously, it's a great league for a lot of players to go to from the CPL. You know, and um, for me, it was just. Uh, making that step to Europe again was was a decision that I had to make. Right at the end of the day, I felt comfortable just because I've already been there. You know, Belgium and and and, and Holland is very similar, right? So just coming back here and everybody speaking English, speaking Dutch, and speaking French, it's it's basically kind of a comfort uh, a comfortable place that I can you know I can I can trust here, right? So yeah. it was a it was a decision that you know I spoke. Yeah, I spoke with my family about, I really thought about it, you know, in terms of, you know, what I wanted to do for the next season, but just, just about hearing a lot of great things about this club made my, uh, made the decision a little bit easier, you know, also knowing, you know, with Montreal is also a great club, but at the end of the day, player has to make a decision if they want to play a few, a few yeah. years in Belgium, if they want to stay in, uh, you know, in Europe. Right. And uh, I decided to make that decision. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, with that decision. And, I'm a I'm a big person that believes that everything happens for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll see how it goes here. Yeah, speaking of making the move uh, to Europe, uh, Emilio Estevez joined uh, Auto Den Haag in the offseason as well. Um, who do you think is the next player to make the move to Europe? Whew, uh, there's a lot of great players. There's a lot of great players, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of good players that had great seasons. I think Taryn had a great season too. Um, Bustos is a great player, right? Yeah. He played very good last year. Now we made the move to go to a different team. You know, I have a lot of great players that play with me at Forge, uh, just players that need a chance to shine right at the end of the day. Right. So, oh, if I had to pick some players, you know, I have to go, I have to go with, with my guys, with my guys, you know, depending on, uh, I, I hope they have a great year, you know, all of them, but just kind of looking at, the qualities that I can see that they had like on the pitch, as long as they get the chance and, you know, they continue to, to prove themselves. You know, I have to go with him because he's at a young age with me. I'm going to say Marcel, Marcel's age. Yeah. Were you surprised yeah. to hear that uh, Emilio uh, got on in the air divisi with that of Zanahag? Not really. Not really. I mean, a lot of people will be surprised just because, you know, it's a first division club and how everything's going. And at the end of the day, people are always going to ask questions. Right. But I think, um, once players kind of take that step and, and, and they choose to come to Europe and they s trust in their abilities, you can see that it's very possible for a lot of Canadians to come. And I've already made that step before coming here when I was in Holland and, and uh, just me coming back at the end of the day was my choice. But I can, I, I can, I can strongly say that there was, there's been a lot of players that I played with back at home that I know if, you know, if, if, if they decide to make the choice and they get the opportunity, cause that's the, you know, that's the biggest thing is, having stuff under your belt you know the cpl is a great platform to you know showcase what you can do and then you know just it's a perfect example with uh with him right there there yeah. will be clubs that you know will have interest in you oh he's seen atiba hutchinson make the most of his opportunity in yeah, Turkey. Yeah. Um, i want to know your thoughts on uh whether or not you think there's a, a stigma around canadian players and maybe there's a hesitancy to sign uh canadian players but maybe if that's changing now with uh alfonso davies yeah, no, I think, I think any young Canadian player can appreciate what he's doing for us. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, and 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 I'm yeah, I'm saying young, and I'm pretty sure he's even younger than me, right? So, but what he's doing is uh, uh, is amazing just for all Canadian youth athletes, even Canadians that are already playing pro already in the CPL, because it just gives confidence all to all of us, right? It it just gives us the confidence uh, in in our own abilities to show, you know, if. He can be doing it at one of the biggest clubs in the world. You know, a club that we look at 
on TV, Champions League, this, that, you know, with the best players in the world, right? It's it's definitely possible. It's 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 yeah. definitely possible, right? And I think uh, it's it's huge what he's doing. Honestly, I think every every player will say the same thing. It's you know, for me, it's trying to follow those footsteps, just playing in Europe, you know, just trying to make a name for myself. And uh, at the end of the day, every player has their own path, but just him doing that just really shows at a young age it's it's possible. You mentioned your time at Heronveen uh, in Holland. Do you feel like it was an uphill battle because you were Canadian? A little bit, a little bit, a little yeah. bit, right? I think uh, just, you know, always having a little bit of that chip on my shoulder just because I'm not I'm not European, right? But um, a lot of people always ask me questions about it, you know, family members. And for me, it's it's a learning experience. Like, I think I wouldn't be the player that I am now if I didn't have that experience in Hedden Fane. Having that, you know, different mentality playing in Europe those few years gives me a different perspective of the game, you know, tactics-wise and technically, right? So, um, no, if, uh, I I think I think it was always a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, you know, but for me to look at it the first time going there at that age, I think it was a uh, success. Unfortunately, you know, uh, I didn't crack the first team. It was a little bit in and out, in and out, in and out, but yeah. at the end of the day, I made the decision to come home and it ended up being great, so... Mm -hmm. On uh, one of our uh, recent shows, uh, Bill Manning had mentioned that uh, you, while you were at uh, TFC's academy, you noticed uh, that you always wanted to, to go to Europe, dreams of going to Europe. Uh, you were there, came back, and now you're there again. Um, what does that mean to you? It's, it's very important for me. It's very important for me. But, you know, the way I kind of look at it is I'm just very happy that we have that league back in Canada. I'm very, very happy. And for me to be a part of that first year was, uh, was amazing. But as a young kid, you know, I don't know if it's the same for every, every young athlete kind of growing up or a young soccer player growing up in, in, uh, in Canada, it's always in the back of your mind, you know, to play in Europe. Right. And at that young age, I made the decision that, okay, this is what I want to do with my life. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to see if I can play professional. Uh, I ended up, I, I was with TFC for a little, a little stinked, but in the back of my mind, it was if I had an opportunity in Europe to go, it's a decision that I would make. My family was behind me. My family was fully supportive on me and on me making that decision. And, you know, me having another opportunity now, just trying to make the most of it. What's the culture like over there? What's, what's your day to day? How much soccer are you taking in uh, within 24 hours? Very different, very different than what a normal day when I had back in, uh, in Hamilton. And kind of what I mean by that is just, yeah. You know, with Hamilton, I'm at home, right? So um, Hamilton was about 45 minutes away from my house. So it was a long drive there, you know, kind of a long day and then long day, a long drive home in traffic and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the night, maybe go see a friend, you know, stay with friends. But here it's when you make that move, you have to understand kind of the commitment, right? You know, uh, early mornings, uh, sometimes two a days. Um, if it's two a days, you stay there at the club. We have a meal together uh, as a team. And then uh, you know treatment is we have we have a we have a big physio staff here. Uh, there's about four or five, so there's constant treatments if you need, you know, and just working on yourself after the second yeah. training, ice bath. It's a uh, you know it's a big commitment at the end of the day. Anybody that plays pro soccer knows that it's your job basically, right? And uh, you know you have to look at it like that because you got to take care of your body as much as you can. And even when I'm coming home, you know I have to make dinner. You know, I, I got to make my meal for myself and. I'm always uh, in contact with my family every uh, every day, so that's at least you know about an hour. You know, speak with my mom, my dad, a few of my good friends, and uh, at the end of the night, maybe just relax, maybe play a little bit of PlayStation, uh, watch a movie, and then get ready for the next day. Right? Yeah, that's kind of a normal. Thing. What are you playing these days? Uh, I've been playing a little bit of Call of Duty. I'm not the biggest PlayStation guy, to be honest, but. Okay. Because of all this, uh, all this going on right now, there's been a little bit more time on my hands, so I've been playing a little PlayStation. That's kind of the only game that I really play, and not to brag, but I'm uh, I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> That's all not right. Well done. This is this is your opportunity to brag. Yeah, go for it. Um, it's been an opportunity the last uh, few months for for players to speak out uh, for for positive change, um, fighting against uh, racial injustice. Uh, for the most part, uh, and uh, there's been some good stories coming out recently, especially from athletes. Uh, Manchester, Manchester United's Marcus Rashford uh, campaign raised funds uh, for free food for uh, um, over a million kids in the UK. Uh, what would you like to see change? What sort of uh, positive influence would you like to make on, on some younger kids? And what are you doing uh, to make that change? Yeah, I mean, 
we all can see what's happening in the world, right? I think um, there's a lot of things I can say. There's a lot of opinions that everybody has about the situation. And for me, I think I think a big step for us to improve on it is is everybody coming together and doing something. You know, just recognizing the situation, not pushing it away, and 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 just seeing what you can do. You know, to help. You know, everybody has their their own lives. Some people make excuses. You know, with being busy and stuff. But at the end of the day, there's always something that that uh, that people can do to help. You know, and and to join in the situation and to come together. Because in my opinion, I think that's the only that's the only way that you know we can we can make any progress with this is coming together. And me just being here and 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 uh, trying to you know stay on point with what's happening, you know, yeah. back at home and, and especially in the States, just coming home. I, I, I was just recently home for, uh, for three weeks. So the first two weeks I had to go in quarantine. So I was in quarantine, but, um, I was a, a little bit lucky on how it happened. The last week that I was there ended up being the peaceful protest downtown Toronto that was actually organized by one of my best friends, uh, my best friend's older brother, who's very close to me. I've known him for a lot of years. And um, it's crazy because it started something so small, just a walk between, I would say, maybe 50 to 100 people. But you can see everybody coming together and it ended up being an amazing, an amazing peaceful protest. And it being, I think, maybe a couple thousand people downtown. And me being a part of that, I ended up going with, the, with a few of my friends. You know, we were all keeping our, our, our distance from each other. Nobody was, uh, nobody was in, I mean, I could talk about myself. I was keeping my distance with, with everybody, but... You could just see everybody coming together downtown. You know, even the even the police. There was police that you know got down on one knee with us at one point. It's it was definitely something amazing to see. You know, just yeah. uh, the first couple of minutes. Honestly, like when I had when I had to look around and see at how many people were there, it, it put a big smile on my face. You know, just to yeah. see that everybody came together for something like that. And I think that's that's the first step to it coming together. Yeah. So. Appreciate that. Uh, appreciate you sharing that story. It does make a difference for everyone that's watching. Uh, you're an inspiration. Uh, so appreciate uh, all the work you're doing. Um, thank you for your time as well, Tristan. Thanks for, thank for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right. For Tristan Borges, uh, producer Lucas Sheffield, uh, technical director, Armin Badaki. And I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, I want to encourage everyone as well to have those difficult conversations at home about uh, racism and racial injustice. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our One Soccer YouTube channel. Have a good one. Take care.